The challenge really is in developing a, a, a much more creative curriculum and challenging the students to think creatively about the kinds of things they could do. Students have a tendency to want to know, okay, what do I need to do to get the best grade? But we want to change that question around. This is a facility, and especially at the undergraduate level, where students don't have very many opportunities at the university to think, you know, this is an open-ended problem here. I can, I can both learn and have fun and do something creative and do real science. And especially for non-science majors, it's probably going to be their only opportunity to do real science. And they're doing the creative work and the imaginative work that, uh, that we all like to think we do as scientists. And, uh, and I think a robotic telescope is the perfect instrument for this. The, the important thing to realize about a robotic telescope, it has a very specific goal, and that goal is to allow students to do their own significant scientific research, even as undergraduates, and in many cases, even as non-majors. And that is not uh, every goal that every instructor will have in an undergraduate laboratory. I think it's essential to have students going up on the roof, looking at the real sky, becoming familiar with the sky. But in terms of doing their own research projects, for the first time, for example, determining the rotation period of an asteroid, that's never been known before. Undergraduates can easily do this with a robotic facility. Looking for new supernovae. Uh, there are many such projects that are simply not possible uh, unless you have such a facility. And uh, they can understand the concepts, and this instrument allows them to, to actually engage in those projects. And we've seen many students who didn't think they could do science get very excited by this. About 1990 or 1991, we had uh, a telescope which was on the roof of the observatory and bought a small camera, a CCD camera, which was we were just becoming available. And uh, had a few students who went up and used it and were very excited. They saw a comet they had read about, took some images, and they said, we really like to do a lot of this sort of thing. But it soon became apparent that Many students couldn't use the facility. It took a, a lot of time to get the students familiar with the equipment. And it, we thought we had the idea, the students and I, wouldn't it be great if we could somehow tell this telescope what we want to do and during the course of the entire night, not just uh, in the evening, uh, all these Im new images could be taken. And uh, one of the students who happened to be very good at computers said, you know, we could do this. We could make this telescope automated and uh, it could observe by itself all night. And uh, I was a little skeptical, but I thought, well, this would be interesting to try. And within a semester, we had a working facility on the roof. Well, after operating the automated telescope facility uh, for about uh, four years, it became obvious that uh, even though the robotic uh, telescope concept was really very good and enabled large numbers of students to do their own research, we just didn't get enough nights. It was a little frustrating for me at the time because we had a bad fall where it was just never uh, clear on my lab night. So I never, never got to look through a telescope, let alone use one, during the entire lab. Two-thirds of the nights in the Midwest are not clear nights. They're either completely cloudy or partially cloudy. And uh, the nature of a robotic telescope is indeed it could be operated remotely from anywhere, not just downstairs. So in 1996, we applied for and got a uh, Iowa Space Grant Consortium uh, uh, award to build another robotic telescope, which became known as the Iowa Robotic Observatory. And uh, that was specifically designed to be in a much more favorable site, in fact, southern Arizona. The facility in Arizona uh, consists of really of two telescopes at the moment, the original Iowa Robotic Observatory, which is a 20-inch telescope, and a new telescope, which we just completed last year, called the Rigel Telescope. Uh, a little bit smaller, but actually a little better design. Uh, and that, that was based actually on our experience over the last 10 years of building robotic telescopes. Both of them are operated over the internet. They're scheduled on a daily basis. The students uh, use web-based tools to schedule the telescope. And the next morning, they again use web-based tools to retrieve their images. The maintenance of these telescopes, uh, we pay a uh, so-called pad fee to maintain the telescope. There's a local guy at Arizona that does periodic cleaning and, and, and other things like that. And that pad fee is, uh, is covered by uh, student laboratory fees. Having a telescope that's in a good site, accessible from the lab here at the university creates the opportunity to, to actually use the telescope and do some, some real uh, work with it. I think that has a lot of appeal 
to the student. It makes it more exciting. And I think the, the experience uh, as an educational experience, it just sinks in a little better when you get to collect your own data and use your data to do the experiment. Students uh, run the telescope. There is a graduate student uh, at the moment and several undergraduates who are responsible to make sure the telescope is properly scheduled every evening and that the images are distributed. Uh, when something goes wrong, they, uh, they deal with maintenance issues and uh, they are actively involved in all decisions that are, that are made with regard to scheduling the telescope and maintenance and, and, and that sort of thing. Since tonight it says it's mostly clear, that means we have a good chance that the run is going to be successful. So I will submit the schedule by saving it and our computer will grab the file off of ours and take it to Arizona where it will be scheduled for tonight. This will be within about 15 minutes. The scheduler has access to catalogs so it knows what's in the sky at what time. So it's able to test which, each schedule as it comes in from the students to see if it's good to go or not. Okay, down here we have red, red listed schedules and green list, red listed images and green listed images. The green listed images are ones the computer is able to schedule for the night. The red listed ones are ones that it is not able to for some reason. The most common one is they're asking for an object that is up during the daytime. So when I sort these, the red bar disappears because it can't schedule them at all, and that indicates that it's sorted. And the second bar here shows the second schedule. And if you notice, they start right around the end of the night, so that indicates that those images are being scheduled during the day and various other data for the star. Right. So I'm going to take a bunch of images, wait for it to blink. Well, yeah, okay, but I mean, how does it blink? I mean, I don't know. I, I want to do something where you can actually see it do something, you know? All right. Do you have any better ideas? Well, did you go to the seminar on Wednesday? Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, remember, uh, Ignacy was talking about the whole plants around white dwarfs? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, maybe we could try that. I mean, yeah. Hmm. He was, I know he was talking about the whole infrared side of it, but... Hmm. I mean, is that in the book? N I, probably not. I mean, it's kind of like it's kind of like eclipsing binaries, except you've got a planet instead of a, a star. But Would I mean, we can like do it. Original and stuff. Sure. I mean, <laughs> I mean, come on, this is about learning, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the book doesn't have everything. Should we check with Ted? Yeah, sure. Hey, Ted. Got a question? Sure. So yeah. I'm interested in doing a project. It's not in the book. Hmm. What do you have in mind? Um, well, did you go to the, uh, the seminar that Dr. Nacy gave on Wednesday with uh, detecting planets from white dwarfs? No, I missed it. What do you? Um, he was talking about the detection of gas giants, close uh, gas giants around white dwarf stars using infrared excess. But I was thinking that you might be able to still observe them if um, if the plane of the ecliptic was right, where there was actually a transit of the planet in front of the white dwarf. I mean, you got a big planet, a little star, right? Mm -hmm. And so you should be able to see um, a serious drop off in the light curve of the star. Well, I was thinking maybe we could try and do something like that. I mean, we could use a lot of the stuff we learned last semester with, right. the, uh, with the eclipsing binaries. And, and then you get this big old planet, which then crosses in front, which then ends up right there, and you've got a total eclipse during transit. Mm. And you know, there's, there's got to be white dwarfs out there. They're close enough we can see them. And if you can see it, you can see it not there, right? That is very true. You know, I, I figure it's worth a shot. So I guess I have a couple questions for you. Okay. Now, that sounds like a really very good topic for okay. this lab. Uh, the first question I think that you guys will have to look into is... Turn. You know, all of this sounds very much like a textbook. You look up the surface temperature of a star. But it's very easy to show that by uh, using a simple algebraic relationship between intensity and wavelength, it's possible for a student to pick any star he likes or she likes and determine its surface temperature actually quite accurately. Uh, to measure the age of a cluster of stars, an open cluster of stars, is a standard thing that professional astronomers uh, uh, have been doing for a long time and still do. And it's possible for students to do this. It's simply looking at uh, a, a cluster, so-called open cluster, in a number of filters and carefully measuring the difference in the brightness between uh, two different filters and uh, measuring that against apparent magnitude and uh, fitting a, a standard uh, so-called isochrone model to it. And to measure the age of a cluster of stars seems uh, 
to the average undergraduate student impossible. How it, it, not impossible, of course, but impossible for them. Because that sounds like real scientific research. Indeed it is. And, uh, and, and many students have done a project like that. We emphasize, in fact, a very essential, I think, a part of the curriculum for them to have the experience of going out and becoming somewhat familiar with the sky. Because after all, they won't be using robotic telescopes for the rest of their lives, but that sky will always be out there.